Good morning. Thank you very much for joining me this morning for the last in this year's series of free webinars for charities. As you know, the topic today is understanding and managing conflicts of interests within charities. So what I'm going to cover for you today is on the, oops, on the slide here. So we're going to start with an overview of the legal underpinnings, just so that you can understand why these rules apply to charities. Then I'm going to take you through a very important point to understand around personal benefits to trustees and connected persons. After that, we're going to look at identifying and understanding what conflicts of interests are. Then I'll take you through the practical steps and the Commission's expectations on management of conflicts once you've identified them. And finally, we'll talk about record keeping and what the Commission expects of you in that regard. OK, so to begin with, a little rattle through the legal underpinnings. The first point to make here is that the duties around personal benefits and conflicts of interest derive from fiduciary duties. A fiduciary is someone who has undertaken to act for or on behalf of another in a particular matter in circumstances which give rise to a relationship of trust and confidence. And anyone acting in the capacity as a charity trustee of a charity, regardless of what your legal form is as a charity, so whether you're a charitable company, a trust, an unincorporated association, a CIO, or some other legal form, is a fiduciary. You are acting in a fiduciary capacity whenever you're making decisions or doing anything in your capacity as a charity trustee. And the duty that you have to avoid conflicts of interest derives from fiduciary duties. The key fiduciary duty that we're talking about here is the duty of undivided loyalty, from which derives two principles, the no conflict rule and the no profit rule. Now, I'm not going to go through huge amounts of detail about how these principles um, came about through the case law over time, but there is a very interesting, uh, at least if you're interested in charity law, documents published by the Charity Commission called uh, legal underpinnings and it's available in the same place that you can find CC29 which is the Commission's guidance on conflicts of interest. So if you would like to understand a little bit more about the law and the legal reasons for the conflict of interest rules then that's the place to have a look. <clears throat> so looking then at the fiduciary duty of undivided loyalty. <clears throat> All fiduciaries owe a duty of undivided loyalty to the beneficiary or beneficiaries. So in this case, charity trustees owe a duty of undivided loyalty to their charity. And the duty to avoid conflicts of interest derives from the fiduciary duty of undivided loyalty. It is considered a distinguishing feature of a fiduciary, it, this obligation of loyalty. And what the law says is that the principal, so in this case, the charity, is entitled to the single-minded loyalty of its fiduciaries. And this core responsibility has several facets, including the no conflict rule and the no profit rule. The no conflict rule essentially says that a fiduciary mustn't place themselves in a situation where his or her own interests conflict with or possibly might conflict with the interests of their beneficiary or beneficiaries. It is the existence of the conflict itself that must be avoided, even where that interest can't be said to have influenced a particular decision. Now, what we see through the case law in developing this principle, this no conflict rule, is something called the self-dealing rule. And case law makes it very clear that it is the existence of the conflict which gives rise to the breach of duty, not any particular action that's taken as a result of it. So it actually doesn't matter whether or not you decide to go ahead with a particular scenario or potential arrangement or transaction that you're considering. You have a situation of conflict if a conflict exists, regardless of any actions or decisions taken as a result of it. It also applies even where there is no particular advantage to a trustee or a person connected with them. There's no requirement also for unfair terms. So, for example, 
if you had a transaction between a charity and say a company that is owned by a charity trustee where that company is offering a really really good deal so an incredibly low rate on whatever service it's going to be providing and so you can't say that the charity suffered any kind of disadvantage because of this arrangement that doesn't matter it still applies the no conflict rule the self-dealing rule applies regardless of whether there's it can be said that there's any unfairness in the arrangement for the charity. <clears throat> Lord Cranworth in Aberdeen Railway in Blakey said, so strictly is this principle adhered to that no question is allowed to be raised as to the fairness or unfairness of a contract so entered into. So again, it doesn't matter whether it influences a decision, whether there's an advantage to the trustee or a connected person, or whether there's any unfairness to the charity. The rule applies the no conflict rule applies in all situations and so that is why it's so important to identify conflicts and then make sure you've got proper authorization and management to avoid being in breach of these principles this rule this no conflict rule applies not only to situations where you might have remuneration for particular transactions so <clears throat> that contract example that i just gave but also to situations where there could be some other form of benefit. So for example, say you have a child who is a potential beneficiary of a charity of which you're a trustee, or there's some other kind of personal advantage or gain that you might make as a result of the arrangement. The question is simply whether or not your exploitation of an opportunity attracts the application of the rule. So is there a conflict or not? The no profit rule is simply that you mustn't profit from your role as a charity trustee. You're not supposed to profit at the expense of the charity, essentially. If you were to profit at the expense of the charity and it wasn't authorised, then you could be found liable to make good any loss suffered by the charity. This applies whether or not the benefit is direct or indirect, so whether it's to you or to connected persons. And they apply even where you've acted in good faith, even as well where the charity can't be said to have been disadvantaged or to have suffered a loss. And even if the charity couldn't have benefited from that particular opportunity. So, for example, if you became aware of a particular contract or um, business opportunity through your role as a charity trustee and benefited from it in a situation where the charity wouldn't have been able to, you're still benefiting from your role as a trustee. Even where there is no duty to account arising, so the charity hasn't suffered a loss due to a breach of this principle, a transaction that's conducted in a situation where there is a personal benefit that hasn't been authorised can be subject to challenge. So this is again why it's important to identify personal benefits and ensure they're properly authorised before proceeding. So that's a very, very brief introduction of the legal principles. And it's from those principles that the fundamental charity law principles are derived. The first of which is that a charity trustee mustn't benefit from the position unless there is explicit authority to do so. And the second is that charity trustees must act in the best interest of the charity to prevent conflicts from affecting decision making. So those are the, the fundamental legal principles that give rise to the practical steps that you have to take in managing conflicts. Now, that's been quite a lot of law. So what I'm going to do now is take you through in, in more sort of practical steps what you should be doing as charity trustees to manage these issues. So I've mentioned personal benefits, and I do think it's important that you fully understand what I'm talking about here, because it is a critical part of managing conflicts is to understand when personal benefits arise and what to do about them. So again, the fundamental principle is you can't benefit unless there is explicit authority to do so. I'm going to come on in a moment to talk about how you go about authorising personal benefits. But to begin with, what do we mean by a benefit? The term trustee benefit includes any payments or benefits to trustees or persons connected with them, apart from reasonable out of pocket expenses, which aren't considered in law to be a trustee benefit. So it doesn't create this, this same issue. Personal benefits include situations where you could receive property, loans, goods or services from the charity. So those sorts of transactional examples. And authority is required where there is a possibility of benefit. 
So you have to ensure that you've got authority for any situations where you could benefit, irrespective of whether there is an actual benefit. So to, to illustrate what I mean there, if, for example, you were purchasing land from the charity and you were paying full market value for that, so you weren't deriving any benefit, you're paying full market value, you have entered into a sort of competitive bidding process, say, for the land, there's no benefit to you at all, you still need to get authorization because you are receiving something from the charity. You are receiving its land. Even though it's at full market value, it is still a transaction that, that gives rise to a need for authorization. So I've talked there about connected persons and the fact that it doesn't matter whether it's a benefit to you or to a person connected with you. If there is any kind of asset cash benefit coming flowing from the charity to you, you need to consider whether or not you have authorization. And that also applies where that benefit is to a connected person. So what do we mean by connected persons? The full definition of connected persons is set out in the Charities Act. So there are two key provisions. You have section 118 of the Charities Act, which relates to charity land disposals, and section 188 of the Charities Act, which relates to contracts for services and goods. That defini those definitions, although they aren't strictly applicable to all situations where there might be conflicts, the Commission does expect you to apply those definitions, those, those, uh, the understood meaning of connected persons in any other types of situations where there, there might be a personal benefit. And so just looking at the section 188 definition, which is the most common one that applies in any situation where there is a benefit to a trustee or a connected person, what we have to start with is your family. So thinking there about parents and grandparents, children and grandchildren, your brothers and sisters and their spouses or partners and your own spouse or partner. To be clear, when we talk about spouses and partners, we're talking about people that you're married to or in a civil partnership with, or people that you are living with in that capacity, even if you're not married or in a civil partnership, that still counts. For children, we're also talking about stepchildren, so people living with you as dependents. And similarly, when we're looking at spouses of children and spouses of siblings, the same principles apply as they do to your own spouse and partner. So broadly, that is what we are looking at in, in terms of family. On the other side of the slide, you've then got organizations, companies, institutions. So if you or any of your family members or two, of, two or more of you together have a connection with a business partner or a con an institution where you control, you have control of that institution, or a substantial interest in a body corporate, then those institutions or organizations or business partners will also be caught as connected persons. So for example, if you run a business in partnership with another person, that person is a connected person to you. If your brother is in partnership with that person, then that person is a connected person to you. On controlled institutions, what we mean is that you or a family member or two of you taken together have the ability to influence and control and make what your what your wishes are, you can affect those decisions in that institution. So that's what we mean by control. Are you able to determine and um, secure that the affairs of that institution are conducted in, in accordance with your wishes or the wishes of your family members or two or more of you taken together? And when we when we talk about institutions here, we don't just mean body corporates. We also can it can mean trusts or undertakings. In terms of body corporates, uh, there's also a substantial interest test, which is 20 percent. So if you or your family members or two or more of you taken together hold 20 percent of the shares of a company or 20 percent of the voting rights in a company that or body corporate that doesn't have shares, then you are considered to have a substantial interest. So that's the legal definition of what we mean by connected person. So that's what you should be thinking about when you're looking at whether or not there is a personal benefit to you or a per person connected with you. So now we know what we're talking about, any kind of personal benefit to you and who we're talking about, yourself and persons connected with you. If you know that you've got a situation where there's a personal benefit, how do you obtain authorization? Well, there are, broadly speaking, three ways to obtain authorization. 
The first is an express provision in the governing documents of your charity. If you have an express provision that permits that particular benefit, then it is authorised. It doesn't mean you can just do it without managing the conflict, but that's the second stage of the process that we're going to come on to. This is just about whether or not you are authorised to obtain and receive the, that benefit that you've identified. Importantly, although it is possible to amend governing documents, there are restrictions around for many charities, charitable companies and CIOs in particular, around making amendments to provisions that allow trustees and connected persons to benefit. And the reason for this is that the provisions of your governing document on benefits must be consistent with the status of the organisation as a charity. In other words, you can't throw in lots and lots and lots of authorizations into your governing documents that go beyond what is merely incidental in carrying out exclusively charitable purposes. You can't use a charity as a vehicle just to, to obtain personal benefit. So it's not a kind of get out of jail free card. You can't put absolutely anything into your governing documents and say, oh, but it was authorized expressly in the governing documents. It still needs to be properly incidental to carrying out an exclusively charitable purpose. And that is why the Charity Commission regulates, it's called a regulated alteration for charitable companies and CIOs. And we are expecting with the new charities bill that's currently working its way through parliament to see that principle of regulated alterations applying also to unincorporated charitable trusts and unincorporated associations. For most trusts and unincorporated associations, you won't be able to amend your governing documents to add in express authorization for benefits without the consent of the Charity Commission, because most trusts and unincorporated associations don't have an express power to make those sorts of amendments. And if you do have that express power, you still need to be mindful of the fact that you can't just authorise whatever you want, because you could be putting the very charitable status of the organisation at risk. So it's an area that you really do need to be careful about. It is standard practice, though, for governing documents to authorise common types of benefits. So, for example, indemnities against personal liabilities, the provision of indemnity insurance for trustees, the payment of a reasonable rate of interest on loans or a reasonable rate of rent on property that is let to the charity. So those are the sorts of provisions that are quite commonly expressly set out in the governing documents. They might, your governing documents might also authorise contracts where services and goods are provided by a trustee or a connected person to the charity. This is quite common in charitable companies. CIOs um, have a reference to the statutory power, but it's quite common to see that in more modern governing documents. But it's important to note that even if you don't have that express power, there is a statutory power in the Charities Act, in Section 185 of the Charities Act, that allows you to enter into contracts with a trustee or connected person for the supply of services to the charity or goods connected with those services. And that statutory power can also be relied on even if your governing document doesn't say anything about it. So that's the second bit. Even if you've not got something in your governing documents, there might be, and that's the, the most common example of a statutory power that is available to you that allows you to authorise a particular proposed benefit. Now, in the absence of either of those things, you're in a situation where you're going to have to apply to the Charity Commission for consent. And a good example of this sort of situation might be where a charity wishes to let property at an undervalue, say, to a, um, another organisation that is connected with the charity but isn't exactly for its charitable purposes. So, for example, you might have a charity wishing to let property to an NHS body, which isn't itself a charity, but is serving the public and will help the charity to achieve its purposes. And in that situation, you might be looking to apply to the Charity Commission for an order to authorise that benefit, that undervalue of rent. You can apply to the Commission, but when you do so, you do have to set out why it's expedient in the interests of the charity to authorise this particular benefit. So whilst you can't actually take the decision to proceed until you have that order from the Commission, the Commission will expect to see why the unconflicted trustees of the charity consider that this is in the best interest of the charity. So you have to go through the decision making process appropriately 
in order to decide to apply for the author order. You can't actually approve the proposed transaction or the benefit until you have that order, but you have to work through why you think you should be approving it. And it's important to make it very clear that even where you have got authority in your governing documents or somewhere else to authorise a benefit, you have to always consider, is this in the best interest of the charity, regardless of whether or not you're having to apply to the Commission to make your case. So that's a little bit on authorisation of personal benefits, and hopefully that's sort of clarified what you're looking at in terms of personal benefits. So now the next question is, what do we mean by conflicts of interest and loyalty? Now, just to be clear, any situation where there is a personal benefit to a trustee or a connected person will automatically be a conflict of interest. But that is not necessarily the only situation where there'll be a conflict. And that's why we need to explore and unpack what do we mean by conflicts of interest and loyalty? Broadly speaking, a conflict of interest is any situation in which your duties to act in the best interests of the charity conflict, might conflict, or might be perceived to conflict with any personal interests or loyalties that you have. It's a very, very broad test. The Commission says the test is always that there is a conflict of interest if the trustee's other interest could or could be seen to interfere with the trustee's ability to decide the issue only in the best interests of the charity. So the question is, is it potentially going to affect decision making or might there be a perception externally that it has? The Commission also says that this should be very much considered as a pre-appointment issue. And we'll come on to that in a little bit, um, a little bit, a few slides later just about the risk of very pervasive or serious conflicts. And if you identify that a particular individual you're considering appointing as a trustee is going to be regularly subject to conflicts because of another position or loyalty that they hold, then you need to seriously consider whether it's going to be appropriate for them to be appointed as a trustee at all. Now, conflicts of loyalty are very, very widely defined. So we're not just talking here about personal benefits to you or connected persons, any kind of advantage or gain, whether it's financial or otherwise. It's any situation where you've got a loyalty elsewhere which could affect your decision making. So for example, and this is quite common in charities, many charities have a number of interested stakeholders or members or member organisations, for example, and many Charities have provisions in their governing documents that allow those third party organisations or stakeholders to appoint a certain number of trustees. Now, that's a situation where you could find yourself in a conflict of loyalty. So you have been appointed by a particular stakeholder or group of members, for example, to represent them on the trustee board. But you have a duty of undivided loyalty to the charity. You have to exercise your powers as a trustee of the charity, only in the best interests of the charity, and not with the interests or desire, desires or wishes of the appointing body in mind. Now, in most cases, it may be completely unproblematic, but you might find yourself in a situation where you have to take a decision about something, and you know that your particular appointing body has a strong view or a financial or other business interest connected with this decision, which is not necessarily aligned with what's in the best interest of the charity. So that's an example of where a, a conflict of loyalty could arise. Another example is where you are perhaps a trustee of more than one charity operating in a similar area, and perhaps those charities are looking at collaborating. Now, it might be that that collaboration doesn't confer any particular benefit. It wouldn't confer any benefit on any on you or any person connected with you. But you still have a loyalty to both charities and a duty to act in each charity's best interests. And so there could therefore be a conflict of loyalty in a decision around particular arrangements to do with that collaboration. Commission goes very far with what it defines as a conflict of loyalty and the guidance CC 29 states a conflict of loyalty could also arise where the religious, political or personal views of a trustee could interfere with the ability of the trustee to decide the issue only in the best interests of the charity. 
So again, what we're talking about here is whether or not any interest or loyalty that you have in your personal capacity might impact your decision making in the best interest of the charity. That is how conflicts of interest are defined. So I've talked here about a few times perceived conflicts or potential you know, situations that might give rise to a conflict. When we talk about perceived conflicts, what we're worrying about here is the reputational risk to the charity. And you might find that there's a situation where actually there isn't going to be any impact on your decision making at all. It isn't going to affect how you decide this. But the you collectively as a board of trustees are concerned that the, there might be a very, very serious perception of a conflict. And in those circumstances, it might be better for you not to participate, just to avoid any challenge of the decision, especially where it's a more serious or significant decision for the charity. Now, if you don't decide to withdraw from the decision making process in a situation of perceived conflict, you have to be ready to defend that decision. So why have you made that decision? Why have you decided that there isn't an actual conflict and so you don't need to manage it in that way? In terms of potential conflicts, how far does this go? And this is an, quite a common area of confusion. I mean, how far do you think about potentially whether a situation might give rise to a conflict? And helpfully, um, Lord Upjohn in Boardman and Phipps states that the test is a, a test of objective reasonableness, which is quite a common test in legal terms. He says it's not you're not expected to go to extreme lengths to think of any possible you know, scenario where there might be a conflict, you're looking at situations where there's a real sensible possibility of a conflict arising, not just any, any potentially conceivable far-fetched notions. Okay, so now we understand what conflicts of interest and loyalties are, what do we do about managing them? What are the steps to take? The Charity Commission sets out its approach in its guidance CC29 and it expects you to identify, prevent and record. So those are the steps to take. And the steps around prevent depend on the nature of the conflict, on your governing document requirements and what's most appropriate in the circumstances. In order to, uh, I, just to say, if you haven't read CC29, the Commission's Guidance on Conflicts, I would recommend it. It's very good reading and it will talk you through in quite plain English what the Commission's expectations are in terms of the steps that you should take. It can also be helpful in drawing up a conflict of interest policy if you don't already have one and you'd like to put one in place. Okay, so identifying, well, we've talked through what what we're talking about, what is a conflict? Now, my practical tip on identifying conflicts is to take a two-stage approach. First of all, ask yourself, is there any benefit to a trustee or a connected person in connection with a transaction or arrangement that we're considering? If the answer is yes, it's automatically also a conflict of interest and you need to be looking at how to authorise that benefit, as I've already explained. Now, if your answer is no, there isn't any personal benefit situation here. Your next question is, well, is there still a situation of conflict or any of the trustees in a situation where their personal interests or loyalties might affect their decision making? An additional point just to note here for charitable companies is those of you who are charity trustees of charitable companies are also, in, as a matter of company law, directors and directors of companies owe statutory duties to the company, which are set out in sections 175 and 177 of the Companies Act in respect of conflicts of interests. It's also important to check section 181 because that makes some amendments to those provisions as they apply to charitable companies. Now, broadly speaking, 175 is about situational conflicts, so probably more your conflicts of loyalty. And 177 is transactional conflict, so any arrangement or contract or collaboration, for example, which could still be a conflict of loyalty. In both cases, you need to make sure that the conflict is authorised and that it is managed appropriately in accordance with the requirements of your governing documents. So having asked yourself those questions, is there a benefit that requires authorisation and can it be authorised? And if not, is there some other conflict of loyalty that we need to be mindful of and therefore do we need to manage it? You're then, having identified the issue, looking at how to manage it. 
The Commission expects you to consider how to prevent conflicts from affecting decisions. Now, this is the management part of the process. You have to stop by prevent, we mean preventing it affecting decisions, not preventing the conflict from arising at all. The Commission accepts and understands that it's very common for conflicts of interest to arise, particularly given how broadly they're defined. It's not a problem necessarily that they arise. What matters is that they are identified and appropriately managed. In order to prevent a conflict from affecting decisions, you've got various options available you might decide that actually you need to completely remove the conflict and that's the sort of more pervasive serious issue where perhaps you don't appoint someone as a trustee or they resign and um, because of the the serious nature of the conflict if that doesn't apply then in most cases you're looking at how to proceed with the decision without being influenced by that conflict and then the other situation, perhaps if you've got a particular conflict that affects all of the trustees, and this can arise, for example, in transactions between charities that have common trustees, then you're in a situation where you're going to need to go and ask the commission to give you the authority to continue with the decision, even though all of you are conflicted. So key steps to take here, declare. So that's your identified part. In preventing conflicts, you need to identify them, but not just identify them, make sure they are known and declared. A trustee has got a duty to tell the other trustees if they have a conflict, and you should be looking to do this as early as possible. You should always identify conflicts at the start of trustee meetings. The commission expects trustees to have a standard agenda item at the beginning of each trustee meeting to declare any actual or potential conflicts in respect of any of the matters to be discussed. Now, importantly, if you're not sure, it is always preferable to err on the side of openness, disclose it and discuss it and decide amongst you whether or not it is a conflict that requires management and if so, how to manage it. As I've said, you need to check about whether or not there are any benefits to be authorised and how to authorise them. And then you need to manage the decision making process. And more often than not, what this involves is that the conflicted trustee or trustees will withdraw from the meeting for the deliberation of the matter and the decision making process and not be counted in the quorum. Now, I have mentioned that there might be situations where too many trustees are conflicted to enable the board to meet corporate in order to take a decision, in which case you need to get authorization from the Commission to proceed with the decision, even though you have that conflict. One of the reasons, one of the key things to think about here in terms of withdrawing, there are some situations where you might not withdraw from the meeting. Um, most charities will have expressed provisions in the governing documents that say what has to happen when a conflict is identified, and you do need to comply with what your governing documents say. Some charities have expressed permission, uh, provisions to permit trustees to remain in the room if it's a very low risk conflict of loyalty, for example, with no personal benefit issues. And if your governing documents are silent on that, then the Commission guidance does include a section on low risk conflicts of loyalty where it might not be necessary to withdraw from the meeting. This is a, a sort of decision that needs to be taken on a case by case basis and what you need to think about and this is my practical recommendation is would it affect all of the other trustees for you or the con conflicted trustee or trustees to be in the room? Is it likely to make it more difficult to have an open and frank discussion and deliberation of the proposal with those people in the room? If so, you'd be better for them to withdraw so that you can ensure that the decision is taken appropriately by the unconflicted trustees in the best interests of the charity. Another key thing to consider is that conflicted trustees can't use information that they have obtained that's been confidentially disclosed in these sorts of discussions and deliberations. They can't use that information for personal gain elsewhere. And to avoid putting a trustee in that sort of situation, you might want to consider that they don't participate in dis discussions and the disclosure of, of certain information. Most of the time, most conflicts are managed by trustees who are conflicted, withdrawing from the meeting and not participating in the decision. If you're thinking about doing anything else, be very careful to ensure that it is possible within the powers of your governing document and check the Charity Commission guidance to make sure that you're not doing something that could be criticised if your decision was later to be investigated.
the Commission asks you as well to consider removing the conflict. Now, this is really only going to be necessary where you've got a very serious conflict. For example, you've got a majority of the board having a conflict or the decision that you're considering or contemplating involves quite a significant risk or high value to the charity. The Commission gives some examples of what it means by serious conflicts. They say conflicts that are so acute or extensive that the trustees aren't able to make their decisions in the best interests of the charity or that there might be a perception that they're unable to do so. If they represent significant or high risk decisions, um, if they mean that effective decision making is regularly undermined and can't be managed in accordance with best practice because of a very, very pervasive conflict, or if there is um, an associated inappropriate trustee benefit that's connected with this transaction, which might be considered to not be appro an appropriate sort of benefit that's incidental to the running of a charity. In this situation, you, the, the Commission expects you to seriously consider not pursuing the course of action that's proposed or proceeding in a different way to avoid the conflict entirely, or in extreme situations, not appointing a person as a trustee because of a pervasive conflict or a trustee resigning their position because of it. So those really only apply in very serious, significant situations of conflict, but it is something to have um, have regard to and don't automatically just go through the process of or we'll manage it by withdrawing from the decision making process. You do need to think quite carefully when there are significant or serious conflicts that again could be objectively looked at and criticised um, as, as not being having been managed properly. In terms of your decision making process then, the courts have established principles for proper decision making by charity trustees. These have been developed over time and it is important that you're able to demonstrate and it, it's more important the more significant a decision is that you have applied these decision making principles. The Commission has published very good guidance called It's Your Decision, which goes through each of these steps in more detail and provides you with guidance on how to take proper decisions as a board of charity trustees. And unsurprisingly, a key step in this is the management of conflict. Now, there have been examples in statutory inquiries that you can read on the Charity Commission's website where particular decisions have been taken with every other step absolutely bang on, but the conflicts weren't properly managed. And that has resulted in a finding of mismanagement in the administration of the charity. So, for example, the Commission investigated a particular charity where a series of loans had been made by the charity to a series of wholly owned subsidiaries of the charity, where some of the trustees of the charity were also directors of those wholly owned subsidiaries. Now, there was no question of any personal benefit. There was no question of improper decision making. It was clear that this was all in the best interest of the charity and that the trustees had carefully considered why they were doing this and that it would ultimately benefit the charity overall. All of those other steps were taken, all other relevant factors were taken into account. But what they didn't do was manage the conflicts of interest and that undermined the reasonableness, the objective reasonableness of the decision and resulted in the Commission finding that those trustees had mismanaged the administration of the charity. So in order to protect yourselves and your decision making, management of conflicts is key. It enables you to demonstrate that your decisions have been taken in the best interest of the charity, because ultimately, if you're able to go through these decision making steps and reach a decision that is in the best interest of the charity and can be seen to be a reasonable decision within a range of reasonable decisions that a group of trustees could make in the circumstances, then it's very, very difficult for your decision to be challenged. A good example of this is the recent National Trust um, issue where the National Trust decided to commission a report into links between some of its heritage properties and historic slavery and a number of people complained to the Commission that the National Trust was acting outside its purposes. The National Trust was able to demonstrate that they had been through a reasonable decision making process, that they had taken all of the decision making steps that they needed and therefore that their decision was within a range of reasonable decisions. Even though a number of people disagreed with that decision, they could show that they had applied these principles and therefore the Commission found that there was no regulatory action to be taken.
So it doesn't matter if a different group of people would have reached a different decision to you. What matters is that you can demonstrate the objective reasonableness of the decision that you've reached and the management of conflicts is absolutely critical to that process. Finally, on record keeping, and this sort of leads directly on from what I've just, say, just been saying on decision making, you need to make sure that you're documenting your decisions in order to demonstrate their reasonableness. And there are a few tools that you can have in your toolbox to help you with this. Trustees should be declaring interests before they are appointed. I said that conflicts and the consideration of conflicts is a pre-appointment issue. So you should have as part of your onboarding documentation, a declaration of interest form that you ask prospective trustees to complete. And then you should be maintaining a register of those interests so that you are clear about which trustees have situational conflicts that might affect their decision making in the interests of the charity. It doesn't replace the need to consider at the beginning of every meeting whether there are conflicts, but it is a useful tool to have in making sure that you are clear and aware and have declared and have evidence of having declared your interests as a trustee. We also do generally encourage and the Commission recommends putting a conflict of interest policy in place. Now, the reason for this is it enables you to set out in quite plain English terms, sort of step by step processes for the management of conflicts, rather than always having to rely on the somewhat legalistic language of your governing documents or the very long guidance of the Charity Commission. It also enables you to think about the sort of situations that might be more applicable to your charity circumstances and how they are to be managed in your organisation. And then, of course, records of decisions. It is no help to you to have gone through a really robust decision making process if you can't prove it. The more significant a decision is, the more we would encourage that your minutes reflect all of the factors that you've taken into account and why you've reached the conclusion that a decision is in the best interest of the charity, including expressly stating how conflicts have been declared and managed in that process. For those of you who are interested in some examples of these documents, the NCVO has a whole suite of very useful documents, a sample declaration form, a sample register of in interests and a sample conflict of interest policy. These are available to NCVO members, but for very small charities, membership is free and the cost of membership of the NCVO is, is quite low. I do think it's an incredibly useful resource for charities, even though there is a cost attached. There is a huge amount of guidance on these issues and many more in terms of governance. Um, and it is an organisation that is regularly keeping on top of best practice and gives you very practical tips and guidance. So that's one place to have a look if you would like something specific. In terms of your records of decisions, the Commission sets out the sorts of things that it expects you to include in your minutes or in your decision making records. And I put those on the slide here. The usual way to record your decisions is in minutes, but if you've made a decision outside of a meeting, then you still need to make sure you have a written record of it and that you keep that with your other records of decisions, so your minute books. So go through all of these things. And again, the more serious the conflict, the more important it is that you set out all of these points. So just to make sure that everybody's had a chance to read them, it, you need to think about the nature of the conflict, which trustee or trustees were affected, whether any conflicts were declared in advance, an outline of the discussions that have been taken, whether anybody withdrew from the discussion and when in the deliberations they did that, and how the decision was in the charity's best interests. Those are the key things to record in your decision making. The final point to make on record keeping and documentation is the legal requirement to disclose payments or benefits to trustees and connected persons in accounts. All charities that are required to prepare their accounts on an accruals basis must include details of payments and other benefits to charity trustees and connected persons, including, as we discussed, family members and businesses. You're also required to say under what legal authority the payments or benefits were made, together with the reason for them. Now, although this only strictly applies to charities required to prepare their accounts on an accruals basis, the Charity Commission does recommend that all charities do this as a matter of best practice in any event. 
Now that is the end of the webinar. And I know that we've got quite a lot of questions on this topic. We've had a few that have come through in advance and a few that I can see have popped up as I have been speaking. So if you just bear with me, I'm going to have a look through the questions. So I've got a question here about uh, what are the related party conflict of interest that auditors are asking us to declare? This was one that was sent in advance. And that's that last point that I was just talking about, related party conflicts of interest, that's benefits to trustees and connected persons. So that's where you have to disclose in your account any benefits to trustees or persons connected with them, which is why it's so important to understand what a personal benefit is, when you need authorization, and make sure you go through that process as part of your conflict of interest management. Somebody else has asked a question in advance about whether or not you can stay in a room to listen to a conversation if there's a conflict of interest. Now, I, I mentioned already that there might be some situations where you can. I think a point I didn't say is that it is sometimes possible, again, if your governing documents allow it, for trustees who have a conflict to be invited to stay in the room to answer questions in order to help inform the unconflicted trustees around their decision making. Now, where you do that, where that's permissible, it's still important that that conflicted trustee then withdraws when you are deliberating, debating and taking the decision itself. Do be careful about keeping trustees in the room. Make sure you have an express power to do that and make sure it's appropriate in the interest of the charity for them to be in the room. Another question in advance related to employees and specifically a question about whether an employee of the charity becoming a trustee where the governing document doesn't allow that, what to do in that situation. Now, strictly speaking, if you are an employee first, before you are appointed as a charity trustee, there isn't a benefit associated there because you haven't obtained your employment, employment as a result of your position as a trustee. So actually, whilst that might look like a personal benefit issue, the decision to appoint an employee as a trustee isn't, but it then becomes an issue when you're looking at things like pay rises and benefits and bonuses to that person in their capacity as an employee. And so what we generally recommend is if you are looking to appoint an employee as a charity trustee, that you do look to amend your governing documents to ensure that that's permissible. And the way to do that normally is to apply to the Charity Commission for consent. Now, if it's the other way around and you have a person who's already a charity trustee and you're looking to employ them, that's a clear conflict of interest and a clear personal benefit that would require authorization. If your governing document doesn't expressly permit you to appoint trustees in employed positions, you do need to go to the Commission for consent. You would normally want either to get express consent for that particular arrangement in the form of an order from the Commission or an amendment to the governing documents if it's something that is likely to be you know, more uh, or affect more than one trustee. For example, in independent schools, you sometimes have the principal, the head teacher on the board of trustees. And so that's an example where you might want to have that in the governing document itself. OK, just looking at some that have come through whilst I've been speaking, if you just bear with me. Somebody has asked whether the fiduciary relationship extends to senior management. Strictly speaking, no, it doesn't. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't consider conflicts of interest in respect of the decisions that are where authority is delegated to senior management and it is best practice to do so. So no, in, in, in strict terms, the conflict of interest rules that I've been talking about today apply to trustees, but we would still always recommend that you think about from a reputational perspective, especially any conflicts that affect, say, a CEO of a charity where the CEO has authority to take a decision. Another question here. In the case where a trustee has a connection to a business offering a fantastic deal to the charity, if the trustee involved excuses themselves from the decision, can the charity accept the deal? Well, that depends. It's not just about managing the interest. It's about whether or not there's a benefit. So, yes, you might have a fantastic deal from a business connected with a trustee. Now, if that deal is about the provision of a service, 
then there is, as I said, a statutory provision in the Charities Act, Section 185, that allows you, the unconflicted trustees, to authorise that decision, provided you go through the strict steps. And they include putting a, a written agreement in place, the unconflicted trustees being absolutely clear that this is in the best interest of the charity. And when you're thinking about that, it's important to think about, for example, what would happen if there were a dispute? How would that affect the relationship of people on the board? Might it result in some sort of difficult internal trustee dispute or make things incredibly awkward? Might it result in the loss of a trustee who then feels they have no option but to resign because of the conflict? And that could be a loss of somebody with really important skills and experience for the charity. So before you decide to take a cracking deal from a business connected with a trustee, just think about all of those factors. Is entering into a transaction with this person, this business, absolutely the right thing for the charity in these circumstances? What are the risks? And do we think that this is the right person to be contracting with? So you need to think about that. Then of course, you have to manage the conflict. So the affected trustee who has the connection mustn't participate in the decision to enter into that contract on those terms. The other trustees have to be satisfied that the terms are the best that the charity can obtain and that they are in the best interest of the charity. And yes, the conflicted trustee should not participate in that decision because that is a clear conflict of interest situation where a personal benefit is, is involved. And in those situations, conflicted trustees should never participate in the decision. So hopefully that, that sort of clarifies that point. Somebody else has asked about be, when you're a trustee of more than one charity, and your loyalties will be with those charities, and whether that would be an issue as far as having undivided loyalty to one charity is concerned. Well, not necessarily just because you're a trustee of more than one charity. When I talk about the, the duty of undivided loyalty, I mean in your decision making for that charity, in your actions as a trustee for that charity. So where you have a decision to take for charity A, you cannot let any of your interests for charity B influence your decision. And if that situation arises, then you shouldn't participate in the decision. That's how you manage the conflict. So where you have a conflict of loyalty affecting a decision that you have to take for one of your charities, then you shouldn't participate. But in many cases, you might be a, a charity trustee of many charities, and the decisions you take for charity A have absolutely no bearing whatsoever on charity B. And so you don't really have any particular interests so far as charity B is concerned in respect of that decision for charity A. And in that situation, there is no conflict of loyalty. It's not the fact that you're a charity trustee elsewhere, it's the fact that you're a charity trustee elsewhere and there is an interest that is relevant to this particular issue or matter or situation that you're considering. Now, in some cases, you might be a trustee of more than one charity that operate in the same area. And there you would need to carefully consider whether the conflict is so pervasive that it would prevent you from acting for more than one charity. Um, and this would be where those charities are perhaps competing for the same sorts of grants or competing for the same sorts of beneficiaries and um, customers and clients, that, that sort of thing. So where you are in a, a very pervasive situation of conflict, you might want to seriously consider whether it's appropriate for you to be a trustee of both of those charities, because it might affect so much of your decision making for both of them, that it's simply not appropriate to be appointed to both. Um, somebody's asked whether I think there's an issue with relatives being trustees of a charity. That depends. Generally speaking, we would always recommend that all charities have a sufficient number of trustees who are independent of each other to enable you to be court when a conflict situation arises. If you have a charity where all of the trustees are related in the same family, and a conflict arises for one of them, that conflict will affect all of them and put you in a position where you can't proceed with the decision without going to the commission for an order to authorise you all to act, notwithstanding your conflict. And so that's where it becomes an issue. So it's not necessarily a problem. And many grant making charities are set up by families who wish to you know, be philanthropic, set up their own charitable foundation in order to put money into it and make grants out to worthy local causes. It's very, very common. 
And more often than not, that doesn't give rise to a conflict because they, the activities of that charity are, are making grants to worthy causes. But should a conflict arise, for example, say one of the family members or somebody else in the family wishes to sell some land to the charity, for example, uh, then that would be a situation where all of the trustees of that charity are therefore conflicted and you wouldn't be able to, pod to continue with that decision without an order from the charity commission. Now, land transactions are, have their own set of rules, which I'm not going to go into today, but generally speaking, the acquisition of land isn't subject to the statutory provisions in the Charities Act, but where you're requiring land from somebody that's connected with a trustee or a connected or you know, with any of the trustees, then you do need authorization for that because there is a personal benefit issue. And so if all of the trustees are connected with that person, you've then got an issue that requires the consent of the commission. So it's just something to be mindful of. Um, what are the connections between your trustees? And do you think that you're going to be regularly in a situation where conflicts arise that you simply cannot manage because you don't have enough independent trustees to do so? Somebody else has asked whether being a volunteer for the charity in another capacity is a conflict of interest. Potentially, yes. If you're a charity trustee, but you also volunteer elsewhere, say in a charity shop, for example, yes, it could potentially be a conflict of interest where a decision is being taken at board level around something that has an impact on that voluntary role. It's not going to necessarily be a conflict in all situations, but it's the sort of thing that you might want to put on the register of interests as a situation. Make sure the other trustees are, are comfortable with you and authorise you still continuing to act, notwithstanding that situation. And then just be alive to any particular matters to be discussed at board level where it could have uh, or result in a conflict of loyalty when you think about what you're doing in that voluntary capacity and what you're doing as a charity. I think the chances of there being conflicts arising are, are relatively slim in that scenario because volunteers of charities are likely to have very similar interests, so the best interests of the charity as trustees, and they're not receiving remuneration for what they're doing. So th there aren't any obvious situations where being a volunteer in another capacity will automatically result in a conflict but it is something that yes you should be alive to and be mindful of when you are making decisions. I think that's all we have time for today but thank you so much to everybody who sent questions in advance those of you who've submitted them today as I've been delivering the webinar and thank you ever so much for joining me today I hope you found this helpful hope it's helped to demystify the issues around conflicts and I wish you all the very best for the futures of your charities see you next year thank you